Hello, my lunatics, and welcome to a new segment that I like to call... Did I miss something? Believe it or not, in nearly 30 years of playing video games... God, I am so old. There's still a huge slew of video games that I have never played or missed out on for various reasons. For example, I played Ocarina of Time, but not A Link to the Past. I played Sonic the Hedgehog and Super Mario, but not Crash Bandicoot or Spyro. Hell, I played Chrono Trigger and the Sui Kon series, yet I've never touched a single entry of the Final Fantasy series. Final Fantasy 13 doesn't count! So for today's episode, I'll be delving into what is considered as one of the best games on the Super Nintendo. Super Metroid. I was like 7 or 8, and I didn't like this game because it felt too slow for me. Mostly because I was kind of spoiled with the high octane action of Mega Man X. Also, you know, ADD. My only exposure to Metroid was Metroid Fusion and the Metroid Prime Trilogy. And I'm kind of kicking myself for missing out on the game that became the genre-defining cornerstone. And after all these decades, it's time to find out... What the hell did I miss? The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. Ah, memories of this game are coming back to me with that actual voiceover, the cutscenes, and that intro level. I remember the first time I walked into that space station and it kind of scared me, especially seeing the dead scientists. And confronting Gridley was a very tense moment as I didn't know what to do when I first confronted that fire-breathing pterodactyl. But now, I can appreciate this profound intro as the hunt is on to find Ridley and take back the stolen Metroid on the planet Zebus. I love Metroidvania games because exploring a game's world rewards you with goodies. And since Super Metroid streamlined this foundation for future games of its kind, it shows. Setting foot on Zebus gives off a sense of isolation and peril, and what appears to be a decrepit planet as the music exudes a foreboding tone with some thundercracks and parts. Once the missile and morph ball are obtained, the game truly begins as space pirates spawn and the wildlife attack you. As I roamed around looking for hidden collectibles, I really had to search high and low for hidden passages that could lead to more power-ups. At first, it was grueling work because the only method of finding secret paths and goodies was mostly done by bombing everything and or using the right power-up. Back in the day, there was no game facts to help you find everything. And while the map system is there, you still gotta remember where they are and how to get them. Once the power bomb is attained, you can kind of go nuts with it to find hidden passages, but this selective destruction isn't the only method of finding new pathways. You'll inherit the space jump that helps you leap to higher ground into more open spaces, and the X-ray scope can scan for hidden tunnels or weapon-specific destructible obstacles. And be able to find the hidden collectibles enhances the fact that Sam's can be much more powerful. The world must be accessible while being subtle at the same time. Whether it's finding the right items or going the right way. Take this area I go into while using the power bomb. As I go in, there's a huge space I can go around in but nowhere else to go. There's a block meant for the grappling beam, but I don't have it, so the only way out is the way I came in. The game could have put me in a spot where I would be stuck and I must restart from my last save. Instead, it's more like, you can't go here until you get the appropriate upgrade, but don't sweat it, come back when you can. It's more inspiring to move further rather than upsetting. Funny thing I realized while writing the script, the color-coded doors are hinted at by the weapon upgrades you acquire. You use missiles for pink doors because the missiles are tipped with pink. Green doors for super missiles since those are green tipped. And orange doors for power bombs because guess what? The power bombs are colored orange. Mind blown. Even heading towards the bosses gives you hints as to what you're up against. For instance, the battle against Kraid. Before reaching him, you go through a hallway while avoiding these incoming spikes being shot at you, stemming from a miniature crate. 
Once you open the door to the boss, lo and behold, you find a gigantic crate, and his projectiles are bigger than the smaller one. The wrecked ship that is haunted by ghostly apparitions foreshadows the battle against Fantoon, and Dragon has his underlings fight you inside Meridia before getting to him. Speaking of Dragon, this fight can be dealt with quickly with just one move. Have Dragon grab you, and while you are helpless to do anything, use the grappling beam on an electrical outlet, which electrocutes Dragon to death for a quick victory. Some other things to note that I liked when I went searching for hidden collectibles, like this hallway with an unbreakable wall. At first, I attempted everything to go through this wall, but failed. Then I remembered this robot I destroyed prior, and I thought, what if I left it alone? So I let the robot respond and do its business, and that robot was the key as it dug through the wall. Another thing I love is when I get the power-ups. You see, whenever you acquire one, you can use them practically immediately. Like before you get the high jump boots, you must pass through a breakable wall and retrieve it after a long fall. Once you get it, you get to relish that moment and use it. The space jump is another because the boss room you are in is expansive, but the way out is high above. But once you get the space jump, leaving is easy. These moments help you savor the momentous occasion on you becoming that much stronger. Yeah, it should be obvious, but this game refined these ideas from its predecessor, and Metroidvania games were built upon that foundation. My expectations were kind of high because of how everyone sung its praises, but here's what caught me off guard. I knew I was exploring a planet filled with dark caverns and unconventional landscapes, but I didn't expect to see a wrecked ship on Zebus, let alone a haunted ship at that. And to find an alien ghost was a great fight I didn't expect. But then as the entire ship comes alive, that also made me smile. While finding some space pirates was expected, I didn't think I would be finding much tougher space pirates. These two space pirates in particular really caught me off guard as not only are they tough to shoot down, they can also leap and use martial arts. I did not expect that level of enemy complexity in the SNES tile. The screw attack guardian fight was also special because unlike the previous fights against them, this one can catch your missiles and throw them back at you to add insult to injury. And once I retrieved the screw attack, I never felt so empowered in the game. The music though, I can see why it is one of the most memorable SNES soundtracks to date. The jungle beats of Brinstar, no affairs, hell like ambience, the haunting tones of the wrecked ship, and the aquatic mystery of Meridia. Although the music is mostly very ambient, I can still remember them off the top of my head, easy. After finding all the necessary bosses, it was time for the final fight with Mother Brain. After traversing some unexpected hazards and metroids, there are these rooms filled with enemies that seem to be devoid of life as they turn to dust upon contact. I didn't know what to expect when I saw this big hopper about to attack. That's when this giant metroid attacked and leeched its life, and then proceeded to do the same to Samus. But to my last health, it stopped and let out its small cries. As it turns out, it was the missing metroid that Ridley took away and felt sorry for attack here. I was like, aw, it remembers her. That was sweet. Then when it finally came to go face to face with Mother Brain, I can see how monstrously intimidating she was. Though I saw videos of the final encounter, fighting her is a whole lot different than witnessing it. As soon as she hit me with that hyper beam, I can see how devastating that attack was. And seeing that Metroid save Samus by completely absorbing the energy and Mother Brain's life force felt so gratifying. But as Mother Brain killed the Metroid, the gloves are off and it's time to unleash a barrage of hyper beams and finally destroying that bitch. But no time to celebrate because the clock's ticking and it's time to go. I managed to escape and even save the animals. So that was Super Metroid. Did I miss anything? Eh, maybe not. But I'm glad to play it anyway. I can now see why the love for the franchise has been strong after all these years, and this game is proof of that love. Every item and upgrade emphasizes how much of a badass Samus is, and there are still collectibles I haven't found. Maybe I'll replay this game again to see how fast I can beat it, or 100% it. This makes me wish, including many others, that Nintendo would show more love and attention for the series, despite its more recent and controversial entry, to which I won't judge harshly because of that. 
To conclude, Super Metroid is a classic and one of the best games on the Super Nintendo. But that's all the time I have for y'all today, so until then, I'm Moon Spirit, and I got a whole lot of catching up to do. Just like me and the 80s Transformers cartoons.